Welcome back to my YouTube channel. You are now listening to episode number two of Athens Coins and History. I will take the opportunity to thank the auction company Roman Numismatics in London for allowing me to use their high quality images for this video. The video clips that appear in this video are my own recordings that I have made either from my own coin cabinet or in connection with auction viewings at the Roma Numismatics office in London. I will initially describe the historical events from the dethronement of Hippias around 510 BC until the collapse of Athens as a superpower in 404 BC. When we have a clearer overview of the historical and political events over this 100 year long period, I will describe how the various coin issues are synchronized with the various political and economical events as well as the exercise of power. However, I want to make you as a listener aware that what I am describing is in no way an absolute truth. The historical descriptions are partly based on old historical sources which in themselves are often recorded later than the events themselves. We can also assume that they are biased in some senses and therefore only convey a perspective of what happened. I have also based the historical descriptions on the information of other authors and researchers who in their turn have made their own interpretation based on their own selection of historical sources. In short, there are thus several levels of potential sources of errors, selective sampling and bias. With regard to the coinage, dating, chronology and attributions of various kinds is based on the information of other researchers who also, to a certain extent, have different opinions on various issues. In short, the description of history and numismatics is a dynamic process where often the canvas that is being painted has to be repainted in new colors as new data comes to light. I have a passionate relationship with the ancient history that can be told by the coins. I also want to emphasize that I am not a researcher in this specific field myself, although I am a numismatic writer and researcher in other fields. When I do my research and writing, it is always important to apply a critical approach to sources from which information is taken. But with that said, I will also point out that I take some liberties when I am trying to describe the issues of coins which I try to connect to historical changes in the form of new rulers or other significant political or economical events. In modern times, it is normal that a new ruler issues his own new coins and medals to propagate his glory. Often, this is also done by re- and overstriking all coins from conquered territories or former rulers. We know that the Athenians overstruck in mass the coins of other states, and most likely the different coin types and variations of the Athenian owl also can be linked to these and other political or economical events. This episode will be divided into following parts. The relationship between Sparta and Athens after the overthrow of Hippias from power by the intervention of Sparta. Hippias' flight to Persian Empire and the provincial capital of Sardis. Historical background to the Persian Empire in Asia Minor and how Lydia and the Greek city-states fell under the power of the Persian Empire. Athens as a new democracy until the beginning of the Greek-Persian War in 490 BC. The period during the Greek-Persian War in 490-480 BC and Hippias' involvement in the first battle at Marathon in 490 BC. The rise of Athens as a superpower and the importance of the new large silver finds made in Larian in 483 BC. The Peloponnesian War in 431 to 404 BC. The collapse of Athens in 404 BC. This period consists of just over 100 years and can be roughly divided into the following four main periods, which is also shown in this illustration. 510 to 490 BC, 490 to 480 BC, 480 to 431 BC, 
431 to 404 BC. Before I begin to describe the period after the downfall of Hippias in 510 BC, I briefly describe what became the beginning of the end of Hippias' reign, namely the attack against the brothers Hippias and Hipparchus and the murder of Hipparchus in 514 BC. After the historical description, I will also give a more nuanced picture of the researcher's perception of the various coin types issued during the later reign of Hippias and during the initial period after 510 BC. It is a somewhat complex picture with a series of varying archaic coin types, but there is no real evidence as to who was the actual authority behind these various coins. It is possible, perhaps even probable, that the different coin types could be linked to the reigns of the different rulers. But, as I just stated, there is a lack of hard evidence as to how this really is, and our knowledge rests on the educated guesses and perceptions of a number of researchers in this field. I will illustrate a few different coin types that can serve as a basis for this reasoning. But first, I will jump back to the year of 514 BC. In the book of the Peloponnesian War, written by Thucydides, who also participated in the war and wrote about it, explained that the plot against the tyrants derived from Aristogaton's resentment of the advance made by Hipparchus toward his young friend Harmodius. The two friends, or lovers, Aristogaton and Harmodius, with a small band of accomplices, planned to kill both Hippias and his brother Hipparchus during the armed procession at the Pan-Athenic festival in 514 BC. The plot, however, miscarried. They succeeded in killing only Hipparchus. Harmodius was slain on the spot and Aristogaton was captured and later died under torture. It was said that Hippias thereafter became a bitter and cruel ruler and was driven to repressive measures over the next four years, contrary to his father Pesistratus, who was seen as moderate in his exercise of power. Hippias began executing a large number of citizens, exiling others and imposing harsh taxes. His cruelty soon created unrest among his subjects and the Alc Meonid, clan who had previously ruled in Athens along with other exiles attempted to free Athens from Hippias by force. As Hippias began losing control he sought military support from the Persians. He also managed to form an alliance by marrying his daughter Archidice to Iantides, son of Hippoclos, the tyrant of Lampsacus. The relationship with Hippoclos helped facilitate Hippias' access to Darius' court at Susa. The Alcumenid family of Athens, which Pesistratus had exiled in 546 BC, was concerned about Hippias forming alliances with the Persian ruling class and began planning an invasion to depose him. Cleisthenes, who had served as Archon in 525 BC before being exiled, bribed the Pythian priestess of Delphi to tell the Spartans that they should help liberate the Athenians. King Cleomenes I of Sparta meddled in total four times in the Athenian politics in the coming years. The first Spartan expedition took place in 511 BC, but was defeated by the tyrant Hippias. The second expedition in 510 BC was successful and Cleomenes I of Sparta invaded Athens and trapped Hippias on the Acropolis. The tyrant Hippias surrendered after the Spartans had captured his sons by chance. He then went into exile into the Persian Empire. The tyrants of Athens were known for the Persian sympathies, which Cleomenes started to vigorously fight throughout Greece at this time. After the collapse of Hippias' tyranny, Isagoras, who had remained in Athens during the tyranny of Hippias, became involved in the struggle for power with Cleisthenes. Isagoras won the upper hand by once again appealing to the Spartan king to help him expel Cleisthenes, and once again Cleisthenes left Athens as an exile, and Isagoras was unrivaled in power within the city and became archon in 508 BC. 
Isegoras set about dispossessing hundreds of Athenian families linked to Claestines and exiling them, he also attempted to dissolve the Boulé, a council of Athenian citizens appointed to run the daily affairs in the city. However, the council resisted and the Athenian people declared their support of the council. Isagoras and his supporters were forced to flee to the Acropolis, remaining besieged there for two days. In the third day of the siege, the Spartan king Cleomenes, who had come to the aid of Isagoras, realized that the position was hopeless and negotiated a surrender. The Spartans were allowed to leave with Isagoras, but the supporters of the latter were massacred. Claestinus was subsequently recalled again from his exile along with hundreds of supporters and he assumed leadership of Athens and became archon in the democracy. After this victory, Claestinus began to reform the government of Athens in order to forestall strife between the traditional family clans which had led to the tyranny in the first place, he changed the political organization from the traditional family clans into ten tribes according to their area of residence, their deem, which would form the basis of the new democratic power structure. He also established sortition, the random selection of citizens to fill government positions rather than kinship of heredity. In addition, he reorganized the Boulé, the council, and introduced the Boletic Oath to advise according to the laws what was best for the people. Now, I will return for a moment to the first struck archaic tetradrachmas. As I said before, there is no definite answer of when the issue of the archaic tetradrachma started. There are currently two main views. One group argues that the coinage probably started around 525 BC during the reign of Hippias and would then constitute a continuation and development of the coinage that started during the reign of his father Pesistratus around 545 BC. The second point of view tends to put the starting date of the coinage at 510 BC, but more likely at 508 BC with Claestinus' definite accession to power and the reforming of the Athenian social apparatus and thus the introduction of democracy as we understand it today. Or, to quote curator Peter van Alphen at the American Numismatic Society, personally, I go back and forth on this. One can of course also ask the question to what extent there was any coin production during the very turbulent years 510 to 508 BC with three rapid shifts of power, with military intervention, and if so, what coin types were issued. But then what is the reason for the variation of the execution of the archaic Athenian tetradrachmas? As shown here, there is a large variation in the execution of the coins on both the obverse and reverse sides. If I base the reasoning on the fact that the archaic owl was introduced in 508 BC under Claestinus, it is most likely that the variation is simply a natural variation occurring over a period of time when the coins were issued and could simply be attributed to the variations when new dice were engraved. Every new die that was engraved varies ever so slightly from previous dice, but also we can be sure that there were several die engravers working over an extended period of time and also that the different engravers also had their own style and skill and thus set their own personal character on the various coins issues. It is outside the scope of this video to discuss the chronology of the coinage inside the group of archaic tetradrachmas itself as to do so a proper die study and how they are linked together must be done. Also, another challenge with die study is to find the fixed point of dating, as the die chain in itself do not tell us the start or the end point of the chain, just how the different dies are linked together. Now, I have reasoned and argued for one view and established the starting point for the archaic tetradrachmas. I will now return to the historical narrative of the development of Athens in order to establish the end point of the archaic tetradrachmas and the starting point of the next type, the classical tetradrachmas.
But with all that said, I still feel it is necessary to outline one possible chronology published in 2014 in the book The Handbook of Greek Coinage Series, Volume 4 by Oliver D. Hoover, with a foreword by Peter van Elfen. How the author managed to establish this chronology and exact dating escapes my understanding, and I currently have no answer as to what facts this dating is based upon. Most likely it is an assumption according to how the styles changes. However, the relative chronology can only be established through die chains and the dates of the various types must be correlated in a more precise way against other archaeological fixed points. Oliver D. Hoover uses the dating chronology which assumes that the owl types began to be struck and issued around 525 BC when Hippias came to power. Hoover then dates the owls to time periods illustrated here and they are apparently based on the research of Seltman from 1927 where Seltman grouped the various types and named them with different letters. The images shown here are from his book. I now realize that my original ambition to tell the story of Athens history and coinage in a few episodes has completely derailed and I need to read up and immerse myself significantly in the latest research in this area. This means that it will take longer to complete this series, but also that it will be significantly more detailed and covered by more episodes than I originally thought. So that you who watch and listen to this series do not have to wait unnecessarily long, I am now publishing episode 2 and then I will dive deep into the coinage of Athens and soon return with the properly illuminated story on a more detailed level. And the initial description of the content of this video will also be distributed over future episodes for the same reason. I hope you find this video interesting and to help others with a historical and or numismatic interest watch this video, please like, share, comment and subscribe. It is free to subscribe and you don't commit to anything nor will you receive any unwanted emails or offers from me and you can whenever you want end your subscription. By subscribing, liking and sharing you help YouTube's and Google's algorithms to rank up this video and thus make it easier for others with a similar interest to view this video. Also, make sure to hit the notification bell to get notified when I publish new video on YouTube. Thank you for watching.